I am most honoured to welcome you all to this very special evening organised by Radboud Reflects, part of Radboud University. I'm Helene Murray van den Berg. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology and Religious Studies. Most of you were present when about 30 minutes ago, Professor Michael Sandel received an honorary doctorate from Radboud University. In this year, 2023, when Radboud University celebrates its 100th anniversary, seven honorary doctorates will be awarded, one for each faculty. The Faculty of Philosophy, Theology and Religious Studies, whose earlier incarnations were among the first faculties in 1923, is the first in line. And Professor Michael Sandel, therefore, is the first to receive his in this very special year for our university. I'm honored to once more welcome Professor Sandel in our midst and congratulate him on behalf of the faculty. As most of you have gathered from the Laudatio by Professor Sharon, Michael Sandel, who teaches polit political philosophy at Harvard University, is one of the most influential philosophers of our time. His books on justice, democracy, bioethics, markets, and meritocracy stimulated fruitful debates among philosophers and scholars in many other fields. Translations into more than 30 languages made his work available to a much larger public, speaking to those interested in the search for a just society in which people of all stripes and colors contribute to the common good. Today's lecture starts from, the, from his book, The Tyranny of Merit, in which he seeks a way beyond the polarized politics of our time. What does our emphasis on merit mostly seen as related to educational success, mean for society. In the current climate of resentment against authority and elites, who are best equipped to rule our countries? Who are the best and the brightest whom we trust to govern? How can we work towards electing governments that represent a wide swath of citizens from all social, economic and educational levels? Tonight, Professor Sandel will elaborate on the topic of meritocracy in relation to authority and government. Who merits to govern us? A few words on tonight's setup. Professor Sandel will start with an interactive lecture of about 40 minutes, to which you here in the Vereniging can actively participate. Following this, Professor Dr. Marcel Becker will chair a conversation between, between Professor Sandel and three colleagues of our university, Caroline van Ham, Professor of Empirical Political Science, Vivienne Matisse Boon, Professor of Philosophical Ethics and Political, Political Philosophy, and Christophe Lutti, Professor of the History of Philosophy. Most welcome and thank you that you contribute tonight. I'm sure all of this will be an excellent starting point for further discussion, including all of you here present tonight. We hope partly during the remainder of our sessions and if not, during drinks afterwards. Before we move to the lecture, one further note. Tonight, Rapport Reflects is doing an audio recording, which means that if you ask a question or participate during the lecture, your voice, no image, will be in the recording. So um, if you don't want that, then um, you have to wait for your questions till uh, after the meeting. I wish you all an engaging and inspiring evening, and uh, with great pleasure, I give the floor to Professor Michael Sandel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those warm words of welcome. We are here to discuss how we should govern ourselves. The short answer, I imagine most would agree, is democratically. But what does democracy really mean? Now, in order to explore this question, I would like to propose that we have a discussion in this intimate group. <laughs> Is that all right? Are you ready to join me for this discussion? The students especially. I would like to begin by seeing what people think about a proposal, a proposal for voting that was offered 
by the philosopher John Stuart Mill in the mid-19th century. John Stuart Mill favored universal suffrage. Everyone should have the right to vote. But he also thought it was important in an age of universal suffrage that those who were well-educated have more influence on democratic decision-making. And so he proposed a system of plural voting. Here's how it worked. Everyone would get the right to vote, but some would get more votes than others. And it would depend on education. So, for example, John Stuart Mill said that those uh, who are unskilled laborers should have one vote. Their voice should count. Skilled laborers should have two votes. Their supervisors, foremans and the like, should have three. Those whose tasks were yet more complex, requiring greater knowledge and judgment, such as traders, manufacturers, and farmers, <laughs> should have four. Four for farmers. And those in the learned professions, lawyers, doctors, should have five, five or six, he said. And those with a university degree should have the most votes of all, at least six, maybe more. He even provided in his proposal that if for some reason your occupation did not reflect your learning, there should be a system of examinations where you could demonstrate your knowledge and win the right to, well, six or seven votes. Now, to begin our discussion, I would like to put to you this question. How many would be in favor of John Stuart Mill's proposal and how many would be against? Raise your hand, those of you who are in favor of John Stuart Mill's proposal. More votes for the well-educated. Put your hands up. Be brave. I don't, I don't see very many hands. My faculty colleagues are all voting in favor. Of the, not really, not really. Raise your hand if you're opposed. Most people are opposed. Let's hear, to begin our discussion, and we have microphones to reach you, of those of you in the majority who are opposed to more votes for the well-educated, what would be your reason? Why are you against? Raise your hand, someone who will start our discussion toward the back and tell us why. Stand up if you would and tell us your name. My name is Celine. Thank you for talking to us. I'm not a student, but um, yeah, um, who defines what is intellect? Of course, your colleagues would say we define it, but um, what about the indigenous people? Are they not intellectual because they live more in touch with nature? Why are we as thinkers more intellectual than they are? So, yeah, that's why I'm opposed. <laughs> And you don't think that the best educated or the most knowledgeable should have more say? Uh, no. You don't? <laughs> no. All right, thank you for that. Who else opposes more votes for the well-educated and will tell us why? Who else? 
Yes. Go ahead. Uh, all right, and then, and then a couple rows ahead also. Go ahead, the person with the microphone, go ahead. Um, I don't see how um, an education somehow um, means I'm more fit to make the decisions for everyone. I might have specific knowledge of law, for example, but that doesn't mean that I know better what is good for everyone. And that's why I would oppose, well, having more votes. <laughs> you would oppose it, so you think everyone should have one vote and only one vote? Yes. And thank you for that. And what's your name? Joost. Say it again. Joost Franse. I Joost. No, that's... Okay, thank you for that, Joost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, why should the people with more education have more say? Joost says. They shouldn't. There's no reason to think they're better at governing. And then a woman a couple rows ahead also had. Uh, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm afraid that it would uh, perpetuate inequality because I think that your voting should be for someone who will represent you and um, you should have a say in who you want to represent you. And uh, yeah, like you said as well, how are we to decide what is good for somebody else who is not in our position? Um, they should have at least the same amount of votes. And Sarah, don't you think that the better educated can govern better? I think that governing is probably an art in itself and that um, how well educated you are doesn't really say anything about how equipped you are to govern. Okay. Necessarily. All right, thank you for that. Now let's hear from someone who disagrees. One of those few brave souls who endorsed <laughs> John Stuart Mill's system of plural voting. Who, go ahead, stand up. Now you heard, you, you heard the argument against. I heard the argument. And, and what, what's your name? Okay. Hi, I'm Robin. Uh, Robin. So this is not a popular opinion, so... <laughs> it's not a popular <laughs> opinion, that's out. okay. You're brave to voice it, so tell us why you're in favor of yeah. more votes for the better educated. I, I mean, I would want to qualify it a bit, but I feel that you, you'd want to... We sometimes seem to work under the, under the notion that everyone should just have a vote on whatever happens without having to qualify that in any kind of way. Very often in our current democracy, you can just vote whatever you want, and you don't have to give any sort of reason for that. Now, I wouldn't want to say that necessarily all educated would get more votes in everything, but if you would have topical things in which they would vote, for example, I feel like, yes, they should be heard more, and they have a bigger understanding, and if we value that knowledge in any kind of way, well, then it should be reflected in our sense of governance. I mean, you could say that knowledge in that sense doesn't matter, and everyone can have their own sense of knowledge or truth, which is fine, but then you have an entirely different set of problems that we have today. So knowledge is relevant to governing. Yes, that's what And I'm those who, who are better educated, more knowledgeable on a given topic, should have more influence in deciding policy with respect to that issue. I would say if we, if we think that knowledge is valuable for taking decisions, yes. it also there doesn't seem to be a priori any reason to reject that reflection in, politi in the political system. Yes. Okay, stay there, Robin. Keep the microphone for a minute. Sarah, <laughs> can we come back to you? You heard what Robin said. Hi, um, Can you speak, speak to Robin? Oh, hi, hi, Robin. <laughs> hi, man. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I understand that, but um, at the same time, I th first of all, I thought this discussion was um, not about who governs, but how many votes people get, which is a different question altogether. And uh, in that case, um, maybe, sure, if you have more knowledge, it's easier to oversee more problems and you can maybe understand them better. But if, you, if we're talking about voting, then it's, you take away people's agency by giving them less votes than somebody else. And they, I, I'm still, um, if you talk about morality, I think it's immoral to take away people's votes because you create inequality, literally. So, I, uh, yeah, I'm opposed to this, I think. Inequality, what about that, Robin? That's a very bad thing, Michael. Um. <laughs> Um, nonetheless, which is, again, not, never a good way to follow that up, but otherwise we wouldn't be having any discussion. 
And there is inequality, right? If I go to a doctor, um, then I expect him to know more than I do. I defer, and there is a sense of... It doesn't mean that the doctor and I are unequal, but I defer to him in these decisions because I think he knows better. Now, is there a complete consensus? No. So I think voting could still be useful in terms of uh, if voting for some sort of topic that is you know, relying on some sort of expertise. Um, so why not? Why not have that reflected? You, it doesn't mean that you can have no solidarity, right? I don't think that's... You can have the dignity of seeing a reflected, being reflected in your vote, but also to accept that your knowledge is somehow limited and to accept that and to say, well, I nonetheless agree with this. Now, if it seems to be that we're use, just using this as, let's say, maybe you would say, technocratic suppression of a minority, well, then perhaps it would be a different sense. But I feel like there's a way to achieve this, to have an, let's say, imbalance in terms of the weight of votes, while nonetheless having a solidary society. A Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thanks to everyone who's joined the first round of this discussion. Let's thank, thank everyone for that. Thank you. Now, I have another question, which moves, brings us from John Stuart Mill in the mid-19th century to the present. If we look at the composition of parliaments and legislatures in most democracies today, the percentage of members of parliament with university degrees is very high. In the United States Senate, 100% of the members are university graduates. In the House of Representatives, 95%. In the Dutch Parliament, around 92 to 93% have higher education credentials, degrees. Now, what is, and the same is true in most European parliaments, roughly 90% have university degrees. What is the percentage of the population as a whole in our countries with university degrees? It's less than half. In fact, the, the vast majority of our fellow citizens this is something that we can easily forget, we who live in university academic settings. The majority of our fellow citizens do not have university degrees. In the United States and in the Netherlands, more than 60% do not. Now, those 60% without university degrees are, in practice, almost, almost absent from representative government. Here's our second question. If it's undemocratic, as the majority seemed to think, undemocratic, for and objectionable to give those with less education fewer votes than those with more, isn't it also undemocratic that those without a university diploma are virtually absent from the parliaments of Western democracies? That's our second question. So, how many consider, here we will need another show of hands, how many consider it to be undemocratic and objectionable that those without university degrees today are virtually absent from parliaments 
elected legislatures. How many consider that undemocratic and objectionable? If you think it's undemocratic and objectionable, raise your hand. And how many don't think so? How many do not find that objectionable? Now, look around. This is a very different vote from the first one. This is more of a divided vote. So, here's the question. If you voted against John Stuart Mill's system of more votes for the well-educated, and you just now did not object to the system of uh, representation, which largely excludes those without a college degree, someone who made those two votes, what's the difference? What's the difference? Is there anyone back there in the, in the balcony? All right, there's someone. Let's, let's let someone in the balcony join in. Stand up and tell us your name. We'll get you the microphone. Uh, good evening. My name is Lisette. Lisette. Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, why I didn't uh, vote uh, for on your second question, yeah. uh, undemocratic and objectionable. Right. It was because I, it's not undemocratic. These. Um, it's not undemocratic. No, they uh, have the right to vote and to be elected, so it's not undemocratic. Um, however, there is a point to be made that it, it might be uh, objectionable, but that's not the same. And it's not undemocratic because uh, everyone, with or without an education, has the right to cast a vote for members of parliament. Is that? Is that the idea? Yes, and they uh, are able to be elected themselves. But very few of them are. However, the system is in place for them uh, to have that chance. Right. Whereas in the John Stuart Mill plural voting, everyone had the right to vote there too. But you were against that. An equal chance. Not an equal chance. And maybe it's still not equal in the system we have today, which could be argued is objectionable, but it's not undemocratic. It's not undemocratic. Was, uh, and that's because everyone has, an equal, has one and only one vote? I'd say so. So the... Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, your name again is Lisetta. Lisetta, almost. <laughs> Lisetta, I'm sorry, Lisetta. No right. issue. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now, is there anyone else who voted against the plural voting system, but did not object or did not deem undemocratic the current system of representation? who would like to explain why. Yes. Uh, my name is Herman. So, um, so I think people have one vote and they vote for people to represent them. Yes. The question is whether the people are in the parliament, whether they represent them. It's not whether they're working for their own interest. People vote for their own interest. And the question is whether the people in parliament uh, represent the interests for the people that voted for them. So I don't see a connection between whether they should be educated or whether they should have the same background if they just represent the interests of the people that voted for them. And do you think that university-educated parliaments, mm -hmm. that parliaments consisting mainly of university-educated representatives, mm -hmm. 
can effectively represent the interests of those without diplomas? Of course, I was expecting that question, yes. So, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's, of course, a, a question whether how that works out in practice. So, I think that uh, in the past, it has worked out in practice quite a lot. I mean, there's been uh, pillars in the Netherlands where the people that were in parliament representing the Catholics or representing the, 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 the working people, and they were themselves not working people, but they were right. representing them well. So, I think it can work, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, hold on to the microphone there. What, what's your name again? Herman. Herman? Yeah. Okay, keep the microphone. Let's now hear from someone who, th who thinks that these two systems are both objectionable. Both the plural voting and a system where those without a diploma are scarcely present in parliament and who would like to reply to the arguments we've heard. Who considers both objectionable? And would like to say why. Sarah, how did you vote on the second one? <laughs> did, you find, did you find this one objectionable? Um, well, I voted... Uh, um, I do think that it is at least objectionable. I'm not sure about undemocratic. Yeah. Um, but I think that is because, uh, for me, I think you uh, noticed by now that the starting point of like unequal uh, chances to get somewhere in life um, is a major like point in this system. So if you are not born in a, into a wealthy family, you don't have money to go to university, you don't have all of the means to do that. Um, that in, currently, that means that you have less chance to end up uh, in parliament, and that is definitely objectionable, and I would also say somewhat not democratic, because you are part of the, uh, the demos of, the, of this country, and you should have a fair chance to, uh, to govern as well as the others. So. But what about Herman's point that people with a diploma can represent those without? Um, yes, obviously, that is true. Um, that's why I'm not quite sure <laughs> yeah. if it's undemocratic, but um, still, I think that um, you can't say that by definition, just because you went to university, just because you have this degree, right. you know how to govern people and how uh -huh. to speak up for people who don't have a degree like that. Right. Okay, thank you for that. I want to hear now from someone who objects to the current system of university graduates dominating parliaments, who thinks it's unjust and, and undemocratic, and who will tell us why? Who holds that? Who holds that view? Yes, over here. Okay, my, my name is Harry. I think we have uh, built a political arena. It's an arena of ratio. It's an arena of uh, discussion. And the arena holds uh, the, 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 the fight, it's the fight, you fight for the word, you fight for having uh, the best uh, votes for the, the best uh, electional right. voice that people vote for you, you yes. fight for it. Yep. And it's the discussion, I think the discussion is not right, you have to find a dialogue. Yes. And you have to, ma maybe you have to make tables where, where people can sit, people, all the citizens with yes. every vote, you can sit on the table and you can have your vote together and you have uh, dialogues together and find what would be justice. So, a di so democracy you're suggesting is not only about voting, it's also about dialogue and deliberation. Yes. And we don't have enough of that, you say, these days. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Who else considers the current system where people without a university education are largely excluded uh, finds that unjust? Yes. Whoop. Thank you very much. I think because it, I think it's in the, my name is Maria, and I think it's undemocratic because 
people don't really get a chance to get to Parliament when they are lowly educated or when they are uh, don't have a lot of money. So I think that's why it's, in my view, not really democratic. You can cast a vote, but it's very difficult to come into the circles of the party and get a place in Parliament. And I think it's unjust because, like Sarah, I think it's uh, uh, it's it um, increases the inequalities and I am afraid that it's one of the causes that now polarization in our society is growing because um, I don't think that it's very good possible to represent people who are living in such a very different way than yourself and thinking so different. You disagree with Herman about that? Yeah. All right. Definitely. All right. I want to thank everyone who's joined this round of the discussion for helping us. It's a striking feature of the current educational divide in representative government that it hasn't always been this way. When universal suffrage was first adopted in the early 20th century, many parliaments to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s had substantial numbers of representatives from, without a university degree and from the working class. More than half members of parliament in some of these years in the Netherlands did not have a university education. This represented a departure from an earlier condition in the 19th century, when there were property qualifications for voting, before universal suffrage. Back then, the, those with a university education did predominate in numbers similar to what we see today. And yet, from the age of universal suffrage to the present, we have the pattern of the educational divide in political representation has come since the 1970s and 80s to approach the levels last seen during the days of the landed gentry and property qualifications to vote. Now, why does this matter? It matters partly for reasons that people have articulated in this discussion for reasons of equality and inequality, for reasons of justice, for at least some conceptions of what democracy requires. It matters today for another reason, which is that we are deeply divided, our societies are, our politics, is deeply polarized. And one of the central fault lines in our politics is the divide between those with and without university educations. Donald Trump won those without university diplomas both times. Those who voted for Brexit were overwhelmingly people without university educations. Those with advanced degrees voted in Britain to stay. So much of contemporary politics, the lines of division and disagreement, track this educational divide. How did it come to be this way? And What's at stake for democracy in this divide? For that, I think we need to step back and look at what happened over the past four decades. The divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has partly to do with widening inequalities of income and wealth. But it's not only that. It has also to do with the changing attitudes towards success that accompanied 
the widening inequalities. Those who landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and by implication that those who struggle must deserve their fate too. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive ideal, the ideal of meritocracy. The principle that says, insofar as chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, we know that in our societies, chances are not truly equal. This came out in the discussion. But suppose we could achieve true equality of opportunity. Suppose we could perfect the meritocracy so that it did not replicate and reflect inherited advantages based on the family of one's birth. What then? Even then, it seems to me, meritocracy would be corrosive of democracy and of the common good. Here's why. Meritocracy teaches that our success is our own doing insofar as chances are equal. And this leads to hubris among the winners and to humiliation among those left behind. It leads the winners to inhale too deeply of their own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, to forget their indebtedness to those who made their achievements possible. Now, how does this connect with education and the educational divide that fuels much of the resentment and grievance that roils our politics. During the age of market-driven globalization, the past four decades, roughly speaking, as inequalities widened and as wages stagnated for most working people, political leaders of both political parties, center right and center left, offered some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, they told us, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. What these parties and politicians missed was the insult implicit in that advice. The insult was this. If you're struggling in the new economy, and if you don't have a university degree, the implication is your failure is your fault. So this, I call it the rhetoric of rising. Everyone should be able to rise as far as their talents and efforts will take them. We heard this intoned, reiterated by mainstream politicians. And on one level, who could disagree, of course? No one should be held back by poverty or prejudice. But the idea that inequality can be dealt with only or mainly by individual upward mobility through higher education, that's, that was the assumption that contained the insult and that animated a growing sense of anger and resentment by those left behind. So, if that rhetoric of rising is not as inspiring as it may have seemed to those who offered it, what's the alternative? What kind of politics should we seek instead? How can we begin to address the legitimate grievances of those who feel not only left behind, but looked down upon by elites? I think we need to reconsider three aspects of our civic life. The role of university, the dignity of work, and the meaning of success. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed 
can easily forget the simple fact that most of our fellow citizens do not have a university degree. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life a university degree that most people don't have. Encouraging people to go to university, that's a good thing. But it's not by itself a solution to inequality. So we should shift the focus of public discourse and we should shift our response to inequality. We should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on the dignity of work, on making life better for those who may lack a diploma but who make essential contributions to our society through the work they do, the families they raise, and the communities they serve. So we should renew the dignity of work and put it at the center of our politics. And this means remembering that work is not only about making a living. It's also about contributing to the common good and winning honor and social esteem and respect and recognition for doing so. It's also beyond rethinking the role of university education as the solution to inequality, beyond shifting our public discourse away from meritocratic competition toward finding ways to invigorate and renew the dignity of work. We also need to consider a kind of moral, even spiritual turning reconsidering the meaning of our success, questioning our meritocratic hubris. Do we really morally deserve the talents that enable us to flourish? Is it our doing that we live in a society that prizes the talents we happen to have? Is that our doing or is that too? our good luck. Here's why it matters, this turning. Insisting that my success is my due makes it hard to see myself in other people's shoes. Appreciating the role of luck in life can prompt a certain humility. There but for the accident of birth, or the grace of God, or the mystery of fate, go I. That could be me. This spirit of humility is the civic virtue we need now. It could be the beginning of a way back from the harsh ethic of success that drives us apart. It could be the beginning of a turning toward a politics that heals the divisions and points us, maybe points us, toward a politics of the common good. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sandel, for your inspiring thoughts and for the way you extract so much wisdom from the audience. Thank you for that. We now go to the next part of the evening, and I will chair that session. My name is Marcel Becker. I'm a social professor of ethics at the Department of Philosophy. And that part is a discussion with three academic experts. Normally, at the doctoral ceremony, there is first discussion with experts, and thereafter, the ceremony. But this night, we did it the reverse way. We have had first the ceremony, so you have your degree already, and now there is the interrogation <laughs> by this mini corona, we can, uh, we can say. Uh, the mini corona Although consists. You should have withheld the, the degree after, to see how I do on this examination. This will be a serious test, okay. perhaps. Okay. Uh, Caroline van Ham, uh, she's Professor of Empirical Political Science, Christophe Luthi, Professor of History of Philosophy and Vivienne Matisse Boon, Professor of Philosophical Ethics. First, the floor is to Professor Luthi. Well, since I have to go first, I think it would be, it's my role to thank you very much for you. Uh, sharing this experience with us. I mean, I think many people in the audience will have seen you holding forth in your just interactive justice course in the Sanders Theatre at Harvard University, but it's quite a different thing to watch you on the screen and to be part of a session ourselves. So I actually propose that we are going to call this hall from now on Sandell's Theatre. <laughs> um, I hope that the mayor of Nijmegen will agree to that change of name. Um, I'm going to make it difficult um, for a start. And I'm going to quote Sandell against Sandell. Um, Hold the microphone a little closer. To yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. We can hear. Um, I, I'm, citing, I'm citing from Meritocracy, page 90. Um, having well-educated people run the government is generally desirable, provided they possess sound judgment and a sympathetic understanding of working people's lives. And then a few pages later, governing well requires practical wisdom and civic virtue and ability to deliberate about the common good and to pursue its equity. Pursue it effectively. Now, the, the reason why um, I, I'm, I'm quoting this in a way against you is because I would like to understand one aspect somewhat better. Namely, when I read your work, I see, in a way, full models of how we could improve what we have now. Because I think we all agree, not all, but most of us agree, that the current situation is not necessarily desirable. But the answer to the question of who should govern us, who merits to govern us, I sense and sometimes read four different answers. One would be, let's not have people govern us, but let's self-govern ourselves. And that would be the old um, Greek idea that in a way we all meet in the town square and battle it out and in the end we reach a consensus. Now that may have worked in Athens and it works in a a couple of cantons in Switzerland where actually the square is big enough for a few peasants who live there to meet. But it wouldn't work in the United States with its five time zones and also not in the Netherlands. So then you get to the model of representative democracy. And then I see one in which you would say, well, people need to have some education because they we don't want to have the, the phonies and the crazies run us. I mean, we see in history what happens when people are not fit to govern, govern. So we don't necessarily want those. But then you get what you address tonight. You, you, get, you get the situation in which only the well-educated end up in these positions. The second one would be, let's have um, a, a more equal and representative share of the various clubs in our society be you know, involved in lawmaking and government. And the third one would be not so much about who is there, but with what attitude and agenda they come, because there's a strong moral sense in everything you write, where the point would be, it's, we don't want technocrats, we want people with a sense for the common good, and then it would be, in a way, irrespective of their educational background, a much more kind of an attitude. So my question to you is, give us model that you think we should adopt? <laughs> well, 
we should be, we should govern ourselves, but we need institutions to enact self-government. And as for, it's true we don't want to be governed or led by those who are not fit to govern. The question is whether there's a very close correlation between having a university degree, or for that matter, from a prestigious university, or an advanced degree, and being fit to govern well. And I think there's not much connection between the two. It doesn't have to be that way. Ideally, the education, the moral and civic education offered by universities should equip students with practical wisdom and civic virtue along with technocratic expertise. But for the most part, we're not doing that very well. And by we, I mean those of us in higher education. The technocratic bent of governance by elites is connected, I think, to the curricular focus of higher education, and in particular to a certain view of the human sciences and the social sciences, and especially economics, that aspires to uh, being a kind of value-neutral science of human behavior that deliberately seeks to exclude or set aside moral and civic questions, moral and political philosophy, to say nothing of the practical wisdom that comes in part through practice and engaging with people from different walks of life. That too is a part of civic education that universities at their best tend not to provide the practical wisdom that comes from becoming embedded in, embroiled and engaged with people from different class backgrounds and walks of life. So if we could imagine an academy that cultivated moral and civic education through a study of moral and political philosophy, that provided class mixing occasions that would cultivate the kind of ability to deliberate and reason and listen to people from different class backgrounds, different ethnic and religious backgrounds, and did that successfully, then those best educated in this special sense, this Aristotelian sense, would be better fit to govern than those who lacked those experiences and opportunities. But that has very little to do with what passes for higher education these days. And if we look as a practical matter, the highly educated elites over the past 50, 60 years have a, a very poor record, actually. The generation who governed at the end of the Second World War did much better. They presided over the, the rebuilding of Europe, the civil rights movement in the United States, economic growth that uh, benefited all uh, uh, classes, whereas the elites who have governed since the 1970s and 80s produced widening inequalities, and if we go back to the 60s and 70s, the Vietnam War, which was presided over by the best and the brightest in the title of a book describing the lustrous advisors who uh, got us into Vietnam and kept us there for a very long time. The Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, widening inequality, wage stagnation for most people, most working people, and a, a financial system that they deregulated and then that, that crashed. And they put together in ways that helped, helped the banks and did nothing for ordinary homeowners. That's the actual record of 
the educated elites, uh, the prestigious uh, uh, academic elites who governed really for the past half century, and it's not very good, and it's led us, I think, to our current Conditions. So I do have some sympathy for the grievances and the anger and resentment for working people and farmers who say um, those elites are not governing very well. A short reaction, Professor Luther? Go ahead, Christoph. Will we go well, to the next question? Well, no, I mean, one, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, but that, that's maybe too complex. I mean, the, the, the um, tyranny of merit is in... in our eyes very American in the sense if you look at the if you look at the institutions of high learning you find them at the top of the let's say 30,000 universities being ranked but also at the very bottom and it, it is true that in the United States you make a break it depending on which you know college you go to this is not the case in the Netherlands so I, 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 I would actually subscribe to most of what you said but what I find so interesting is that you continue speaking about education, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a university education. Right. Also be, yeah. I mean, I think where it goes wrong in the United States is primary education, which is based on property tax, and if you live in a right. very poor area, you get just really bad primary education. So I think what you want also is for, for people with a kind of, for, the, for the, the moral training and the civic sense, you want them, however, to have some education. It doesn't have to be an Ivy League university, but you want them to get some training. And the interesting thing with the word meritocracy, whether it's used positively or negatively, is, is always linked with education of some level. Yeah. Now that, and, and with this I end, the most amazing turnaround of the Italian government a few months ago was to call the Ministry of Education by a new name. It's now called Ministry of Education and Merit. So in a way, um, even if one doesn't want meritocracy anyway, anymore in the kind of negative sense that you correctly um, uh, criticize, one still wants an educational system that brings about the ability to engage in a moral discourse, I think. I get yes. the impression yeah. that yeah. Professor Sodell agrees so much <laughs> that she can go to the second question. <laughs> For the sake of time. It's a home run. So, Professor Van Ham. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would just like to note that uh, I am here entirely by luck because I was very lucky to be born in the Netherlands and very lucky to get access to the type of education uh, that, that brought me to this chair. So I, I fully agree with you. Um, my question is a bit about technocracy versus populism, right? These two sort of Ever, yeah, two, two sort of anti-democratic reactions, so to speak, where technocracy definitely for me is the more autocratic one and has created populism. It has yes. created populism as a counter-reaction. Yes. So my question to you is, um, from the technocrat perspective, thinking of how Hillary Clinton presented the deplorables, right? Where these are not just people you disagree with. No. These are people that are, they have no right to be citizens, they are actually, they don't even have right to be humans. So there's this delegitimation of your opponents, which happens when she says that. Uh, so let's say that's what happens on the higher educated side. And of course, to that comes a counter reaction from the populists that say, no, we are actually, we have a right to be citizens. We have a right to be heard. We are humans, um, which then sort of overreacts and also tries to take away their rights. So we're going to lock her up. And, you know, we take away your voting rights because we won the election. And even if we didn't win the election, we're still going to take power. Uh, so my question is, if we get in the space where we don't see each other anymore as citizens, we don't recognize each other, not even just as citizens, as human beings that have a right to be there, to be heard, how do we get out of this? So this morning I was on the bike and I was thinking... Racists have voting rights and I will defend their voting rights even if I fundamentally disagree with them and don't even respect their position. How do we get to that space again where we can speak to each other and recognize that we're all part of the same demos? Yeah, yeah, that's a hugely important question. And I agree that the dominance of technocratic orientations to politics created a moral void, a vacuum, an empty space in public discourse, a hollowed out public discourse that opened the way for the right-wing populist backlash. 
because people want public life and public discourse to be about big things that matter, including questions of values. People want to be able to reason together and argue together in public life about fundamental questions of justice and the good life. And so a technocratic managerial politics is not only, not only leaves very little scope for democratic decision making, but it also creates this moral void that sooner or later is filled by either hypernationalism or fundamentalism as a kind of reach for meaning, a kind of moral meaning in politics, even though very dark and dangerous. So I think the main project we need to undertake to rescue democracy from, on the one hand, technocratic elites, and on the other, uh, right-wing populist, populist with authoritarian tendencies, is to reinvigorate public discourse in a way that engages with contested moral questions. Part of what animates the technocratic uh, refusal to welcome competing moral convictions in politics is the idea that in a pluralist society we can't hope to agree if we start debating messy, controversial, moral questions in public. So better to aim for a kind of tolerance, agreeing to disagree, but not but asking people to leave their moral and spiritual convictions outside when they enter the public square. And in any case, the complex questions about how to run an economy or how to regulate the financial system or, for that matter, how to deal with climate change, which is where we will see a real test of this, is best handled by those who know about the science, whether it's the spurious science of orthodox economics, the kind that animated the, the neoliberal version of globalization, or even whether it's the entirely uh, legitimate and important science that tells us about the human role in climate change. Politically, we will be at an impasse in dealing with climate change if we rely mainly on elites telling people, listen to the science. Listen to what we scientists say or what our scientific advisors say. We need to reconfigure the economy to become a green economy. So here are the rules that we need to do. And in the case of France, that means to enact a fuel tax. And then that leads to the backlash of the, the gilets jaunes. Or in the case of the Netherlands, the, the regulations uh, about the fertilizer and so on that prompted the backlash of the Farmers' Party. That's, that technocratic way of dealing with climate change, trust us, learn more science, then you'll agree with us. That's a recipe for deepening the backlash rather than addressing it. To address it, I think, to go directly to your question, we have to have a more deliberative politics from the ground up, not from the top down, that engages communities of working people and farmers whose lives will be upended by the transition to the green economy. To invite them from the start into deliberation about how to deal with climate change, difficult though that may be, beginning small, and working from, from there. That would be one example. Otherwise, I think we're going to have the same, we're going to deepen the, the anger and resentment through a top-down uh, climate change policy rather than solve the problem. We're, we have a short what do you think? For one question, or do you only confirm what Mr. Sandel says? I, I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're there yet, but basically you need... So the solution is, I, I, of course, I ask you for a solution, so 
the solution is basically to have this bottom-up politics and to have politicians, technocrats, recognize their lack of experiential knowledge. Yes. So they should yeah. be more virtuous and respectful and go to the people. Is that what you're? Well, and generate, f uh, and we need to create what we l currently lack: our forums for deliberation closer to the ground, closer to these communities that that engage the the people whose lives are most directly affected. It may be that the politicians themselves are not the best conveners, though they should try but we may need to look to civil society to convene and create some of these uh, closer to the ground forums for deliberation and then figure out ways to have the results inform policy and what the politicians do. I think that is a pretty good transition to the third yeah. interlocutor, Professor Matisse Bohm. Um, I hope this thing is on. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, yeah, it does indeed very much relate to the question that I have. I want to pick on a point that is in the introduction of your book on meritocracy, where you state that indeed the winners, um, in the context of the pandemic, that the winners in the pandemic also believe their own success is their own doing, whereas the losers believe that uh, you know those on top look down at them with disdain, and then yeah. you make the argument that then they turn to resentment and anger, and as a result of that, they move to authoritarian populism. Yeah. Yes. However, I wonder if in the context of the pandemic we actually see a very different dynamic going on. Perhaps one well, could even label it as an insidious form of meritocracy, whereby actually the majority of people believe that simply by the merit or by the luck or virtue of their good health, their strong immune system, they believe that they've earned the right to return to normality. And that actually that this belief of turning to normality itself is based on adherence to a form of pseudoscience, mm. whereby they can actually have the luxury to neglect scientific facts, mm. right? We don't have to deal with it because I'm strong. Um, and it also relies on an embrace of basic neoliberal necropolitics. And so I wonder if actually the situation that you sketch out in the beginning of your book is not the other way around, whereby the losers of the pandemic, so the vulnerable, the chronically ill, and also those you know, 500,000 of long COVID patients here in the Netherlands, who basically actually are now fighting for a more inclusive democracy and a more egalitarian society, whereby the voices of the voiceless are also heard. This then relates to the second question that I have to you on this, which is also like, does your whole model not presume a level of voice, the ability to raise your voice as well? Um, and what do we then do with those who cannot raise their voices, who are literally tied to the beds, who don't have the capacity to speak out? How do we weigh those concerns against the concerns of the rousy you know, people that basically do raise their voices? Yes. And particularly in the context of having the luxury of being able to withdraw from science. And do we not also, with the withdrawal from science, move to a form of relativism and actually go into the traps of authoritarian populism? And by withdrawing from science, you mean, it, say a little bit more? Basically, if you have the luxury to say, okay, I'm going to ignore, for instance, that COVID is airborne, you know, yeah. it's just dealt with washing your hands or right. whatever, those right. kind of things. Right. I have the luxury to ignore and pretend that everything's back to normal. Everything's I fine. see. And people who didn't want to wear masks, people who didn't want to get vaccinated, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, that thing. You have the luxury to pretend everything's back to normal. Whereas for a large section of the population, it isn't. And their lives have been uprooted. They've been firmly disabled. Yet their yeah. voices and the activism that they also entail is not heard. It's not yes. there. Yeah. And they don't have the luxury to withdraw from the scientific facts. In fact, they, they fight for biomedical science. Right. So, and I also wonder if then actually what you sketch out in the book, which is basically losers and winners, and the losers return to authoritarian, return to authoritarian populism. Uh, sorry, the winners turn to, uh, sorry, the losers turn to authoritarian populism. In fact, in the context of the pandemic, I think we've seen the opposite, whereby the winners turn to authoritarian populism. Well, by winners and losers, I guess there are different dimensions of winners and losers, which is the point that you're bringing out. There are those who, in virtue of the work they do, struggle economically with stagnant wages and with job losses and with the loss of social esteem. That's one, uh, and who are looked down upon by those who have reaped the benefits of neoliberal globalization. Uh, 
that's one way of describing the divide between winners and so-called losers in economic terms and class terms. But what you're bringing out, and it's, it's very important and intriguing, is whether there is another dimension in the aftermath of the pandemic where the so-called winners are those who ignored public health precautions and got away with it for whatever reason. Yeah, and that's also turned into a sense of normality. And, and then those who were left behind or who were disempowered were those who got long COVID, who suffered serious uh, health consequences. And that they did, you're suggesting, was partly thanks to the renunciation of science by the deniers. Do, do I have it right? Yeah, in the sense that the anti that they could ignore the science was very much based on this presumption that you know I have the merit of a healthy body. I see. I don't need to engage yeah. with the actual the fact that we're all vulnerable. Right, right. Well, there are two accounts of why people, some people during the pandemic, did say, "Well, I have a healthy body. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to wear a mask." Partly. It was just out of a renunciation of science, which, now why would they renounce science? I think partly out of a sense that those who invoked science to defend lockdowns and mask mandates and so on, they viewed with suspicion and mistrust. I think there's partly a political reason, and also that they saw these mandates as violating their freedom. So they, they were suspicious of the invocation of science because they were suspicious of experts. And I think that the reason for the deep suspicion of experts during the pandemic, public health experts, is connected to the lost credibility of economic expertise during the four decades prior. That's my, I think that fueled this, the uh, distrust of experts, and that it spilled over into a suspicion or a wariness of public health and medical experts, and that led many people to renounce science. In fact, even the, the, the contest over science became deeply political, and this is in line with what you're saying, suggesting, so that Liberals often said and proclaimed at political rallies, I believe in science, as if science were a matter of faith and they were professing their faith. I believe in science. And the figures you're describing who uh, flouted public health advice um, thought, well, I think many of them did identify scientific expertise with people looking down on them with experts generally. And I think this does have a longer history of, uh, connected to neoliberal economic expertise. But you're certainly right that those who suffered health consequences as a result were, were the victims of this ill-conceived response to the demands of public health. And, and and this failure to care for the common good on the part of people who refuse to go along with these mandates. Thank you. Normally, the committee has to retire and to decide whether the degree will award it, but I think I can say as chair of the committee that the degree is awarded with three to zero. Am I right? <laughs> Unanimous. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, where are we supposed? Yeah, listen.
Yeah. Some, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Second? No. Ladies, we now go to the and now we now go to the final part of the evening. And it will be the question and answers with the audience. Michael Sandel. So everything you always wanted to ask to Professor Sandel, but never dared to ask, please feel free to do it now. And it can be related to the talk you gave before. It can be related to what just happened. I see already a question over there, the lady. When you stand up, say your name. The microphone is coming to you. The young guy with the microphone is coming to you. Okay, please, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Nienke. I was today in your masterclass, but I didn't get to ask my question, so now I do it. Here, you, here we are. Um, I'm writing my thesis about effective altruism, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on effective altruism. And since not everyone may be familiar with effective altruism, can you just explain maybe in a sentence what, well, or, or do you want me to do it? Well, effective altruism is... A, a way of trying to do good in the world, altruistically, in a way that maximizes the benefit, of the effect of our charitable contributions or altruistic activities. Is that a fair summary? And it arises, it's an, I should put it this way, it's an application of a utilitarian philosophy. Utilitarians say the right thing to do is to maximize happiness or welfare, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, in a slogan. It's a philosophy that goes back to Jeremy Bentham and finds a recent proponent in the utilitarian philosopher Peter Singer, and followers of Peter Singer and of Bentham have launched the effective altruism movement as a way to encourage people to maximize the effects of their altruistic or charitable activities. And Inka, I don't know whether you're arguing for or against effective altruism. She's a neutral scientist. Oh, yeah, I see. But I don't like it much. <laughs> Not because I'm against altruism, and not because I'm against effectiveness. <laughs> but because, like all utilitarian thinking, effective altruism flattens what it means to promote the good. Here's how. Let me take a concrete example. Effective altruism counsels young idealistic people who want to do good to maximize their ability to contribute to the welfare of others. Which means, for example, if someone wants, an idealistic young person wants to enroll in the Peace Corps to do good, or to become a doctor working in a developing country in a place where health care is scarce. That's doing good. But if that prospective doctor who wants to go work for Médecins, Médecins Sans Frontières could, happens to be good also at finance, and could get a job with a hedge fund, then effective altruism argues that it's a mistake, a moral mistake even, for that prospective doctor in an African village or community to waste time being a doctor because how many patients could she see and help in a week or in a year? A limited number. But if she could work for a hedge fund or go to Silicon Valley and devote her talents instead to making $500 million, 
she could hire lots and lots of doctors to go to work in many, many villages and do greater good than she could do working herself in that calling. This seems to me, this advice, seems utterly consistent with the utilitarian logic, but morally perverse and misdirected because it neglects the role of character in ethics, the role of virtue, and the way in which the example we set by the way we live our lives and by the work we actually do, not just hiring other people to do that good work, not only reflects our character, but also sets an example that makes a difference to the world that can't be captured by the utilitarian calculus. That's why I'm not a fan of effective altruism. Thank you. Thank you. Further. Okay. I see the, the gentleman next to the row, the just before you. Okay. Please stand and mention your name. And oh, I'm sorry if I could just add one further note. The Sam Bankman Fried, the guy who had this uh, a cryptocurrency thing, hundreds of millions that turned out to be a Ponzi scheme and fell apart. He was among those who was advised by the effective altruists to go into that field of endeavor. Thank I'm sorry. You. Go ahead. For that tradition. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next question. Yeah, thank you, Professor. My name is Charles. I'm from Boston, so welcome to Nijmegen. Um, <laughs> um, I have uh, an observation regarding this uh, uh, sort of flow of advocacy about epistocracy. And I'm just wondering where or what happened to Amitai et Sione communitarianism. Why are we not talking about that? And obviously it's time. Okay, well let me take the question generally to be a question about communitarianism as an outlook and as, an, as a way of thinking about politics and philosophy. In the debates about liberal political philosophy, there were those of us who criticized the liberalism of John Rawls on the grounds that his version of liberal political philosophy, which is deeply influential and powerful, depends on, makes the case for the following idea, that we should seek principles of justice and fundamental rights that don't depend for their justification on any particular conception of the good life or of virtue, that don't depend on any substantive moral or spiritual conviction. And the reason we should seek neutrality toward the good when we're talking about the basic structure of society is that this is the way, the best way of honoring a certain conception of individual freedom. The freedom of each person as an individual or each self to choose their ends for themselves rather than to have the, uh, our ends and purposes shaped or directed or coerced by a framework of rights that isn't neutral, that imposes on some the values of others. My argument against this version of liberalism was that it's not possible to be neutral in this way in defining and defending principles of justice and fundamental rights. Not only that, conceiving the case for neutrality as relying on the idea that we are individual choosing selves rather than encumbered selves defined by our communities and our traditions and our backgrounds and our cultural experiences. Misses an important part of human agency. 
we are defined in part by our community encumbrances. That was the argument. And that was the so-called liberal communitarian debate. And I was not the only one to raise this challenge to liberalism, but a group of us did. And we came to be identified as the communitarian critics of a certain rights-oriented individualistic version of liberalism. So what's become of that? Well, some of us, not all of us, who were labeled as communitarians, were, me included, were uncomfortable with the term because it easily suggested the idea that justice and rights are merely relative to the values that prevail in this or that community at any given time. But communitarianism in that sense deprives justice of its critical character. The community's values may be wrong, may be unjust. And so the real issue, as I saw it, and others who were labeled communitarians saw it, was whether it's possible to detach questions of justice and rights from debates about the meaning of the good life and of virtue. And I think some of us resisted the communitarian label for that reason. I certainly did, whereas there were others who embraced that label and uh, sought to promote yep. various policies that gave greater weight to the community and to strike a better balance between individualism and communal claims. But I think that's why the communitarian label or movement, if you can call it that, faded away. Thank you for that clarification. On the Wikipedia page on Michael Sandel, you are still labeled as a communitarian, but now... On which page? You. Wikipedia. The Wikipedia. Ah. <laughs> well, yeah, which is why okay. we can't believe everything we read in Wikipedia. <laughs> that is just a point. Okay. <laughs> okay. One final short question. Final short question. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Rose. Um, I was just talking to my friends at the beginning um, that I, I found it quite, not sure, funny as the word, uh, that you were given your message about what deserves praise um, and what merits praise and recognition that you were receiving an honorary, honorary doctorate. I thought it was a quite a funny, ironic thing. Um, and I was, I was asking my friends, I, I wonder how, how he feels about this kind of... Um, <laughs> So I thought I would ask. So I thought I might as well ask how you feel about that. Rose, do you think I should feel uh, uh, funny about it? <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> I think, well, I guess I think that with all honors of this kind, it's important not to inhale too deeply in the sense, I mean, I couldn't disagree with the word that was said about how wonderful I am. <laughs> but I think it's important to appreciate honors such as this while at the same time holding on to the thought that I sort of lucked into this, to all of this, really. I don't mean just specifically this occasion, but to the circumstances that enabled me to arrive at this occasion on this stage in this company of colleagues. So I don't think that, well, I hope that my honorary degree is not an instance of the tyranny of merit. But I think a lot depends, and this is true of every, uh, this is true I think generally of our stance toward aspiration and achievement in our lives, that it's important to remain alive to the role of luck and chance and indebtedness for everything that, uh, that comes our way. And so uh, 
I guess that's how I think about it. What, <laughs> what do you think, Rose? Is that you and your friends, you find that acceptable? Let me confer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.